Coming up, we get an exclusive look at the second season of National Geographic's America's National Parks. We hear about the young leaders at NTII's mid-year conference. And the co-chair of the Denver American Indian Commission talks about positive trends in his town. Plus, we'll learn more about a nationally unique lending innovation being led by an Indigenous financial services organization. I'm Mackenzie allen Charmley. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 Indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of Indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class Indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Chinangale, we're so glad you could join us. It was election day for the Cherokee Nation's 450,000 citizens in Oklahoma. Results from the tribe show Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin Jr. has been re-elected to another four-year term. The 48-year-old attorney won with 63% of the vote. Hoskins' Deputy Chief Brian Warner also cleared the path to victory. The duo ran on a platform of protecting tribal sovereignty and increasing funds for language revitalization programs. Data shows that under Hoskins' first four years in office, the nation's budget has more than tripled. Hoskins' leadership has been tested through multiple attacks from the state's governor, Kevin Stitt, as well as the landmark Supreme Court case, McGirt v. Oklahoma. The Cherokee Nation's other elections for tribal council will head to a July runoff. We turn now to Salish and Kootenai territory, where a mother somehow finds strength in the anguish following the roadside death of her daughter. Blackfeet citizen Micah Westwolf was killed by a vehicle while walking along a highway on Montana's Flathead Reservation in March. More than two months later, no arrests have been made. A heavy weight hangs on Micah's mom, Carissa Heavy Runner. Some days are harder than others. The State Highway Patrol told ICT News that the case remains under active investigation, but Heavy Runner can't keep still. She put up a memorial by the road where her 22-year-old daughter died, wears a pin in her honor, and planted a tree for her. I'm just taking it day by day, knowing who my daughter was, her character, her spirit, and she gives me strength. And she would always tell me, Mom, you're so strong, you're the strongest person I know, and how come you're so strong? And and I would just say, well, because your grandma's, your my mom. I said, we're all strong. We're Native women, and that's just how we are. Heavy Runner also pulls strength from her daughter's writings. I carry different one of her journals uh, in my purse. That's what's given me strength to fight for my daughter, and I'm not going to fight with hate because that's how other people, that's all they know. They, they, they fight with hate. You can't fight hate with hate. I will fight with love. Now Heavy Runner and her supporters are planning four days of awareness walks for Micah and for other families living with loss. They say cases involving Native women get less attention from the authorities and from the media. And that breaks my heart to hear that these families are struggling still and they can't have any closure or heal and we're doing the walk as a statement that we want justice justice to be seen in carbondale colorado stuart huntington ict news for more information on the june 13th through june 16th awareness walks you can visit micamatters.com in New Mexico, a lawsuit is being revived against a teacher who is accused of cutting a Native student's hair. An appeals court ruling has renewed an anti-discrimination lawsuit accusing an Albuquerque teacher of mistreating Native American students. 
The lawsuit alleges that in 2018, English teacher Mary Jane Easton cut off about three inches of a native girl's hair with scissors, even sprinkling the hair on her. Outrage over the incident pushed legislation in the state to protect against discrimination based on hairstyle or religious head garments. An American Civil Liberties Union representative said the appellate ruling validates that all students must feel safe at school. A spokeswoman for Albuquerque Public Schools said the district is considering options to appeal. Moving to sports, the Vegas Golden Knights have extended their lead over the Florida Panthers in the NHL Stanley Cup Finals. The series now stands at 3-1. It's been an exciting matchup knowing one of these two Indigenous players will be a 2023 NHL champion. The Golden Knights and Sioux Valley Dakota Nation citizen Zach Whitecloud take on the Panthers and Mohawk citizen Brandon Montour Tuesday night in Las Vegas for Game 5. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Tribal leaders flew into Minnesota by the hundreds last week. It was for the gathering of the National Congress of American Indians and its young leaders. ICT's Paris Wise has this report. NCAI's mid-year conference was held last week at Mystic Lake Casino on Dakota lands. Tribal leaders and government officials gathered, as well as the NCAI Youth Commission. The Youth Commission held programming of their own, including a cultural camp with painting and archery. The Hochokarati Cultural Center gave the youth a unique opportunity to connect with the local lands and community. We want to go beyond the land acknowledgement, so we reach out um, to the local planning committee that we um, normally have uh, established with every um, conference that we are, are hosting, and um, we're able to work with individuals. Um, and, and this opportunity came up with one of our local planning committee uh, members. Um, so uh, we were invited to this beautiful facility um, that they have their culture camp um, and, and give us a, a really hands-on approach uh, about learning about the peoples and, and the culture that they're, um, you know, that they have. The cultural center holds about 80 events a year for the tribe and serves as a home to the community. He were here sitting on Dakota land and within the state of Minnesota, um, our Dakota people really, um, not that we own the land, but we, we have our homelands here. And so um, the tribe started out with a very small acreage after our uh, unfortunate time with these treaties, but uh, we've grown to about 4,000 acres now. And one of the things that we wanted to do was provide uh, natural habitat for our uh, animal relatives and plant relatives. So we're sitting on about uh, 700 acres of natural prairie grass. And what's cool is um, the bees, the butterflies, and these, uh, these birds, they need this uh, area to survive. And we've seen such a uh, regrowth with their uh, population so it's been really nice um, we do have some waterways and we're actually really close to our old traditional um, village site and so um, yeah just nice to to be out and about on the the lands here and we're just so uh, happy that we have land to raise our families and so it's uh, an effort to uh, help educate but promote culture uh, language and um, encourage the youth to get more involved uh, and just have fun so uh, really today you know uh, with this conference it was an opportunity to be a good host and so we have tribes from from all over and so uh, many of them have never been here so we want to provide a nice uh, opportunity for them not only does mid-year have a lot to offer the youth but the youth have a lot to offer the conference as well well, I think the Youth Commission is really great because like we're all, I mean, we're youth and we have, I think that's why it's important to have like an age range on the youth because it's like we all have like these similarities and we all are seeing the world from this very unique perspective that like leaders in government don't have and aren't referring to a lot of time. So on the Youth Commission, um, 
we see like us talking about like different um, patterns in our, like our reservation life and urban life, um, in academia, in like just our like cultural um, understandings and ways of growing up, and um, we see like the problems in that or the way that it's worked really well. And so like we've had really good like jokes and conversations and stories, and I think like all of us have really been like a little bit of a like a little family. And every time we we reunite at these conferences, it's like a big reunion, and like we're all like so happy to see each other, and we're always looking to like get away and just like spend some time with each other. Having youth with all of these leaders is essential to like kind of how NTAI functions. Um, we want to make sure that like we're being heard, but also like they're making informed decisions based on how the, their decisions are going to affect us. Um, because you know, they're passing policies, they're looking at different bills and resolutions, and it's like it doesn't matter unless you have the youth kind of engaged on those issues. And so um, us being here really is important oh, yeah. for you know, putting, that, putting those, those policies and issues forward. But also I think it's great because we have the opportunity to bring in speakers that are young and that are like making their own way. And it, it also like then builds new relationships. And then it's like, now we have these like young women and young men who are like from around Indian country that are doing great things that like also are sharing their perspective and sharing their experiences. But they're also like, I don't know, they're also showing us that like, these are the things we need to be focusing on. We definitely want to make sure that um, they are, you know, provided a chance to learn about how they can grow as individuals, how they can be, um, you know, those future leaders. Um, I, I tend to not say that they're going to be leaders in the future because they already are taking that step um, by coming to our conference and, and being leaders in their own right. Um, so I, I feel like we're just kind of enhancing those like skills and providing them these different um, uh, ways to, to be um, advocates. In Prior Lake, Minnesota, Paris Wise, ICT News. Season two of the docuseries, America's National Parks, takes viewers to lesser known parts of the United States. Episode four features Lake Clark National Park and it's narrated by country singer Garth Brooks. Here is this exclusive clip from National Geographic. This annual migration of salmon is a symbolic marker in the calendar of the people who traditionally live in Lake Clark National Park. the Denaina. They have been in Lake Clark for thousands of years. Salmon are one very important piece of a larger tradition of living with and caring for the land. Ruth Miller was raised in the Denaina homelands. This is my people's land. We call it Pijne Vena, the place where people gather. It's where my ancestors are buried and it's where I feel at my happiest. Growing up in my territory gave me access to the forest, the mountains and the water. Native people to this day live off the land. We trust in the ripening of the berries and the freezing of the ice. We depend on the timing of the salmon runs to our bays and to our rivers. My people maintain a deep spiritual connection to this place. Ruth carries out a salmon ceremony, making an offering of the bones from last year's salmon to help the fish recognize their pathways home. Yes. 
To live sustainably with the land means practicing gratitude and giving more than you take. The Dena'ina way of life is a timely reminder to us all that we're not separate from nature, but part of it. Episodes 3 and 4 of America's National Parks premieres today on Monday, June 12th at 9 p.m. Central Time. You can watch all the episodes on Disney+. Plus. As co-chair of the Denver American Indian Commission, Joshua Emerson has a front row seat on race relations in his city. He says he sees some positive things happening, like a local museum listening to the Native community by shutting down an American Indian exhibit the museum now calls racist. But he's not an all-work and no-play kind of guy. He's also a stand-up comedian who says his love of comedy bubbled up from the deep currents of humor that flow through Indian country. ICT's Stuart Huntington caught up with him last week. First off, the, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, they did a community outreach. Uh, they wanted to have a conversation. There's been an indigenous peoples exhibit there at the museum pretty much since the museum's opened. And there's been in the recent years uh, calling for that, that it was an outdated idea, that it was a sort of a historical look at indigenous people. And the problem that you get there sometimes is that you forget that indigenous people live in a contemporary existence. We live today, I live today. And, and unfortunately, the Indian country deals with uh, you know, issues at the Supreme Court, issues with missing and murdered indigenous relatives, all of which are contemporary issues that we need community buy-in. Um, from, from everybody around us, especially in urban center. So it was definitely interesting. I love that they did the community outreach and then followed through on what the community told them that they wanted, which was to close the exhibit. Um, and, and so it's, I think it's part of a larger trend with the Denver cultural institutions and in trying to rebuild those relationships with Native Americans here in Denver. I gotta say that sounds like a very positive trend. I feel I feel great about it, and and the thing about the positive trends is that they can go away. Uh, they come from a lot of years of people working in the community, and, and they have to be maintained by people continuing that work because that we've had positive trends with uh, Indian country, you know, in the '90s, and, and then again in the 2000s, and we've lost momentum. Denver owns a buffalo herd. It seems really cool, and it also seems like it's been a source of some healing. Yeah, so the city of Denver, through their city parks and recs department, they own about 30 buffalo up at Genesee Park and a couple more at Daniels Park. And they've used to, what they used to do, the part the herd would get too big, mm -hmm. and so they would just uh, have an auction for meat for the uh, extra members of the herd that they needed to do when it grew too large for the space. And then about three years ago, in conjunction with the, the Talbot Memorial Council and the Federal Tribal Buffalo Council, I think is the full name of it, um, they all came together and they repatriated those bison. Now they're going to tribes all over the country. And and I like to use that word. People thought, say, use the word donation. I don't I don't like that word. I, I really like the word repatriation. I like the idea of giving back those relatives back to the people where they belong. Um, I think that that's a lot more powerful than the idea that we're that, that they're being donated. They, I think that they're always ours. They're always ours, and now they're coming home again. I mean, the city of Denver is one of, it's the only city to do this, the only city. And it's this type of work in the community, this is real, this is real relationship building with the tribes, treating them as sovereigns, and then also trying to, to yeah, yeah, get our relatives back home. That's real honest work. They're, they're outpacing states. They're outpacing a lot of uh, larger organizations. So City of Denver, all the people involved in this, Talbot Memorial Council, uh, and everybody involved should, should feel really proud about this, I think. Okay, that's very important, serious stuff. Let's switch to perhaps your true love, comedy. That's right. 
I know. Isn't that isn't that funny? I uh, I'm a standard comedian. I love it. I here's the thing. I when I grew up. The funniest people in my life were all native. All right, they roasted me. They made me. They made me feel silly, but then they made me feel loved. It was part of the community. Navajos, we have a celebration for when a baby laughs for the first time. It's in us. It's so important to our community. It's how we deal with the the real struggles that natives deal with every day. And and I found down in Durango when my uh, girlfriend broke up with me, uh, a real love of being able to take the energy that I have, the passion that I have, and just unite a whole bunch of people through laughter. And so that happened down in Durango about five years ago. I, I've been so uh, addicted to it ever since. And I, uh, I, <laughs> I started going through the club system. We have a great club here comedy works one of the best clubs in the world um yeah yeah probably top six in the world love that club and but there were no natives around me when i went there and that didn't make sense to me because like i said the funniest people when i was growing up were all native so it should be you know a certain amount of them you know um and so i see i see that as an issue and so i have i produce one of the only native american comedy showcases here in denver with creative nations uh up at the dairy art center usually uh we're doing one with the museum of contemporary art in august um down in denver and then the next day we'll be at comedy Ford up in fort collins uh but the idea the idea is very simple i want to create opportunities for native comics to showcase in front of great crowds and then i want to do a little bit of culture sharing i want people to know that natives are funny um that's very important to me and so uh, i want to work on that the rest of my life Joshua Emerson, thank you so much for joining us today. That's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Citizens of the Leech Lake of Ojibwe in Minnesota face predatory lenders and mortgage denial rates five times higher than the national average. Enter the Credit Builder Program. The brainchild of a Leech Lake citizen, Rob Atkin, it is a different way for Native people to invest in themselves. He joins us now virtually with more information. Hi, Rob. Hi. Let's jump right into it. Why are Leech Lake citizens so vulnerable to predatory lenders and is there any way to take on these practices? Oh, well, um, I guess the vulnerability lies with, um, it's a low to moderate income community. Um, we've got generational poverty and um, we really lack of an, an ability to create assets. Right. And sometimes the best asset for somebody would be a home. And in order to get a home and own a home, you have to have credit. Right. So that's where it all starts. Uh, increasing somebody's quality of life really starts with getting your finances in order and getting a, yourself a, a credit score that's worthy of um, being uh, approved by a lender. What are some of the other challenging challenges to building credit and wealth within Native communities? Well, we're a Native CDFI, which is a community development financial institution. We're not a bank. We're not a credit union. We're kind of below that in terms of regulation, but we serve a historically underserved population. A lot of banks and financial institutions aren't geared for services to our community. So our services and our products are all geared for folks that live in our area. I was hoping you could touch more on the importance of once you have that capital to invest, what, what about financial coaching? What's the importance of that? Setting goals. That's what we help people do here. We set financial goals. Whatever somebody wants, somebody needs, we help them set a goal and then find out ideas that are gonna get them all the tasks that need to be done to reach that ultimate goal. Could you walk us through your program? I understand that it's different in that you can use your paid time off as collateral for a loan. Yeah, the Credit Builder Loan Fund is one loan fund that's designed for folks to use their uh, paid time off as collateral. So any loan recipient of ours, um, if they separate from employment for any reason, those leave hours pay off the entire balance of their loan uh, through the uh, entire loan period. Those leave hours get returned to them, just like any other secured collateral. And where do you hope the program will be in 10 years? 
Um, I hope that we are in the same state where we're at now, helping folks with their leave hours, um, getting um, their credit up. Um, we've made a 50-point jump in the time that we've been doing it, so maybe we can go another in 10 years. Maybe we can have a 100-point jump in our average credit score that we pull on the Leech Lake Reservation. And if people are wanting to learn more about your program, where can they go to find more information? Our website is www.llfinancial.org. And very quickly, do you have any advice um, for any financial advice in general? Yes. Anybody that's trying to build a credit history, avoid the credit cards and get into installment loans that are the same payment every month, like a car payment or a boat payment or ATV or something along those lines. It doesn't have to be big, but installment loans are what drive those credit cards, credit scores. It's kind of a myth that credit cards build scores. We want folks in installment loans, and that's what we offer at Leaflet like Financial. Well, Rob, thank you so much. Yes, it's been great being on the show. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.